before vaccines, before antibiotics, before people even knew what germs were, medieval men and women had to survive in a world swarming with disease, famine and filth. They drank water from muddy wells, slept in smoky huts and ate bread laced with mould. Children died young, plague swept across kingdoms, and yet somehow many endured. The question is unsettling. Was their immune system tougher than ours, or were they simply surviving on the edge of extinction? In the medieval world, survival was inseparable from dirt, disease, and daily exposure to germs. Children were born not into sanitised rooms, but into smoky cottages with earthen floors, where livestock often shared the same space as their owners. Drinking water was drawn from rivers and wells contaminated by waste, while food was stored in ways that encouraged mould and pests. This environment became, in a strange sense, a natural training ground for the immune system. From a young age, a medieval child's body was challenged by bacteria, parasites and constant infections. Cuts from farming tools could easily become inflamed and wounds were rarely treated with anything beyond cloth and herbs. Yet those who survived childhood gradually developed resilience. Their immune systems learned to recognise and fight off a wide range of everyday pathogens. This constant exposure created a paradox. On one hand, the body became more accustomed to a dirty environment than modern humans, who live with filtered water, antibiotics and sanitised homes. On the other hand, these early challenges also came at a devastating price. Many children never lived long enough to see their bodies adapt. For those who did, immunity against common illnesses became their silent armour. Medieval resilience, however, should not be romanticised. Living close to the earth meant enduring constant suffering. A child might survive measles only to die from diarrhoea caused by tainted water. A farmer might withstand minor infections but fall victim to pneumonia in a smoky, unventilated hut. Nature's school of immunity was brutal, unforgiving and costly. What it left behind was not necessarily stronger humans, but survivors of a ruthless biological lottery. The medieval world was a graveyard for children. Nearly one out of every two newborns never reached adulthood. In many villages, families buried more infants than they raised. Childhood, as we think of it today, barely existed. Life was fragile and death was an everyday companion. When disease struck, it targeted the smallest bodies first. Diarrhea, fever, measles and whooping cough, illnesses that today are easily treated, were often fatal to children in the Middle Ages. Malnutrition only worsened the risk. Without steady access to protein, vitamins or clean water, young immune systems were constantly under siege. Yet this tragedy created what historians call a natural filter. The children who survived past the age of five were not average. They were the strongest. Their immune systems had endured repeated assaults and learned to adapt. In a sense, every surviving adult was proof of a brutal selection process, shaped by disease and deprivation. For parents, this reality was heartbreaking. Mothers might give birth to ten children, only to see half of them die in infancy. Fathers built tiny coffins as part of life's routine. The grief was immense, but it was also normalised, woven into the medieval understanding of fate and God's will. The survivors grew into adults with remarkable tolerance for infection, their bodies having fought through more in childhood than many modern people will face in a lifetime. But the price of this resilience was unimaginable. Entire generations shaped by loss, where strength came not from abundance, but from suffering. For all their hard-earned resilience, medieval immune systems were powerless against new and devastating diseases. When the Black Death arrived in Europe in the mid-14th century, no amount of childhood survival or natural exposure could protect them. The plague swept through towns and villages with terrifying speed, killing rich and poor, strong and weak alike. In some cities, entire families perished in a matter of days. This was the cruel reality of infectious disease. While daily germs trained the body, new pathogens found medieval populations defenceless. Smallpox left survivors scarred or blind. Cholera and dysentery spread through contaminated water, striking without warning. Even influenza outbreaks could devastate entire communities already weakened by hunger and poor sanitation. The difference lay in novelty. The human body builds resistance by recognising what it has seen before. But when a new microbe entered the scene, whether carried by trade, war or migration, no immune memory existed. Entire populations were like dry tinder, waiting for a spark. The tragedy was that many of these epidemics struck repeatedly. Plague waves returned every generation, scarring the psyche of medieval Europe. Survival in daily life offered no guarantee of survival during a pandemic. In fact, the stronger adults 
who had withstood common illnesses, might still collapse within many days when faced with plague or smallpox. For medieval people, epidemics were not just moments of crisis but reminders of human helplessness. They lived with the knowledge that no matter how tough their bodies seemed, one new disease could reduce a thriving town into silence and ashes. Nutrition was one of the silent architects of the medieval immune system. For peasants, the daily diet revolved around bread, pottage and ale. Cheap, filling, but rarely balanced. Grains like barley, rye and oats were the backbone of survival, boiled into porridge or baked into dense loaves. Vegetables, when available, added bulk but not always essential vitamins. Meat was a luxury, often reserved for festivals or for the nobility. This left most people with significant nutritional gaps. A lack of vitamin C meant scurvy during harsh winters. Iron deficiency contributed to chronic fatigue, particularly in women who endured repeated pregnancies. Calcium shortages weakened bones and teeth. These deficiencies quietly eroded the immune system, leaving bodies less able to resist infection. Even worse were times of famine. A poor harvest could plunge entire regions into starvation. During such years, weakened immune defences made communities easy prey for epidemics. Hunger and disease reinforced each other. Malnutrition lowered resistance, while illness further drained strength. Yet medieval diets were not without hidden strengths. Fermented foods like cheese, beer and sauerkraut provided beneficial bacteria that may have supported gut health. Garlic, onions and herbs were staples of folk remedies and carried mild antimicrobial properties. Honey, prized as both food and medicine, offered natural antibacterial effects. Still, these advantages could not compensate for scarcity. The peasant body endured constant nutritional stress, which shaped its immune capacity. Stronger than modern bodies in tolerating dirty environments, perhaps, but far more vulnerable to collapse when famine or infection struck. Diet in the end was as decisive as disease in shaping medieval survival. Cleanliness in the medieval world looked very different from what we imagine today. Soap existed, but it was harsh, scarce and expensive. Most peasants washed only occasionally, often in rivers or with simple rinses of water. Baths were considered a luxury, sometimes even suspicious, since people believed soaking opened the body to disease. Instead, many relied on perfumes, herbs or linen undergarments changed to absorb dirt. This lifestyle meant constant exposure to germs. Chamber pots were emptied into the streets, animals lived alongside families, and waste flowed into the same rivers that provided drinking water. Yet paradoxically, this filth created a kind of rugged resistance. Medieval people's immune systems adapted to a level of microbial exposure that would likely overwhelm many modern individuals. Allergies, asthma and autoimmune conditions, so common today, were almost unheard of. However, adaptation was not immunity. Contact with dirty water often caused chronic diarrhoea. Skin infections spread quickly in crowded towns. Lice, fleas and ticks thrived in unwashed clothing, carrying diseases into homes. The body could endure grime, but it was constantly paying the price through exhaustion, malnutrition or premature death. In a way, medieval hygiene trained the immune system like relentless sparring matches, strengthening in some respects, but wearing it down in others. Daily life was less about conquering germs and more about surviving long enough to see another season. For many medieval people, health was not a state of wellness, but a struggle with ongoing illness. Chronic conditions shaped daily life and constantly tested the immune system. Worm infestations, for instance, were widespread, sapping energy and nutrients. Hookworms and roundworms lived in the intestines of children and adults alike, weakening their bodies year after year. Respiratory problems were also common. The smoke from indoor hearths filled small, poorly ventilated cottages, leaving generations with damaged lungs. Coughs, bronchitis, and even tuberculosis haunted communities, gradually eroding their defences. For farmers and craftsmen, untreated wounds and infections from minor injuries could linger for months, draining strength stolacy but relentlessly. These chronic burdens meant that the immune system was always on high alert, constantly engaged in battles it could never fully win. Instead of saving its strength for sudden infections, the body was worn down by endless small attacks. Malnutrition added another layer of stress, making recovery painfully slow. The result was a cycle of vulnerability. People might resist minor everyday pathogens, but when a major disease like plague or smallpox struck, their already exhausted bodies collapsed quickly. In this sense, the medieval immune system was both toughened and weakened at the same time, trained for endurance but robbed of reserves. 
To live in the Middle Ages was to exist in a state of fragile balance, one infection or injury away from disaster. What modern medicine now calls chronic illness was then simply life itself. Modern science offers a fascinating mirror when we compare our immune systems with those of the Middle Ages. Today, most children grow up in clean homes, drink purified water, and receive vaccinations that prepare their bodies against dangerous diseases. Antibiotics and advanced medicine step in when infections appear, often saving lives that in the medieval world would have been lost within days. But this protection comes at a cost. Many scientists argue that modern immune systems are under-stimulated. Without early exposure to dirt, microbes and parasites, our bodies may overreact to harmless triggers. The result is a rise in allergies, asthma and autoimmune diseases in industrialised nations, conditions that medieval people almost never experienced. Their immune systems were constantly busy, fighting real pathogens, leaving little time to attack themselves. On the other hand, the medieval population faced catastrophic vulnerabilities in new epidemics. Where a modern child with a vaccine can withstand measles, a medieval child often faced death. Where antibiotics can treat pneumonia in days, medieval families watched loved ones fade in smoky cottages. The contrast highlights a paradox. Medieval people were hardened against everyday infections while we are shielded from them, but sometimes weakened by our own immune responses. Neither system is better. Each is a product of its environment. What is clear, however, is that the line between strength and fragility has always been thin, whether in the filth of the Middle Ages or the sanitized world of today. In the absence of modern medicine, medieval people turned to two primary sources of healing, faith and nature. Doctors existed, but their knowledge of the body was limited, based more on ancient theories of humours than on scientific fact. When illness struck, many families relied on prayer, pilgrimages or relics of saints, hoping divine power could heal what human skill could not. Alongside faith came folk remedies. Herbs such as garlic, onion and sage were common in kitchens and apothecaries, valued for their supposed healing powers. Honey was used to soothe wounds, and vinegar was believed to cleanse. Some of these remedies did carry real antimicrobial properties, though no one at the time understood the science behind them. Others, like charms, spells or bleeding with leeches, were less helpful, all and often harmful. Religion gave comfort, framing disease as part of God's plan or a test of faith. Monasteries grew medicinal gardens, preserving herbal knowledge that would influence medicine for centuries. Still, these treatments were small shields against massive threats like plague or smallpox. Prayer might soothe the soul and herbs might ease pain, but they could not stop epidemics from sweeping across Europe. This reliance on faith and limited remedies reminds us of the vulnerability of medieval bodies, Without antibiotics or vaccines, every illness cam emstes carried uncertainty. In a world where science was yet unborn, hope itself became a form of medicine. Old age in the Middle Ages was rare, and when it arrived it came with frailty. Few people lived beyond 50 or 60, and those who did were often bent, toothless, and weakened by decades of hardship. Their immune systems, already burdened by a lifetime of infections and poor nutrition, grew weaker with each passing year. For the elderly, even minor illnesses could be fatal. A winter fever, a chest cold, or a wound that refused to heal might end a life. In times of epidemic, the old were among the first to die. Their bodies, once trained by exposure to countless germs, simply no longer had the strength to respond. The lack of consistent nutrition made matters worse. Tooth decay and gum disease limited what older people could eat. Chronic pain, arthritis, and failing eyesight left them vulnerable to injury and infection. Unlike today, where medicine extends vitality, medieval elders lived at the mercy of their body's decline. Yet surviving into old age was a sign of resilience. To reach 60 in a world of famine, war, and disease was extraordinary. Such elders carried scars of endurance, having outlived plagues and hardships that claimed so many others. Their lives were proof of strength, but also reminders of how fragile the human body eventually becomes, no matter the century. Looking back, the medieval immune system reveals a paradox that still speaks to us today. These people were tougher in some ways, hardened by constant exposure to dirt, germs and infections. They rarely struggled with allergies or autoimmune disorders because their immune systems were always on duty. Yet they were fragile in other ways, helpless against new diseases, malnutrition, and epidemics that modern medicine can now prevent or cure. The lesson is not about who was stronger, but about context. 
A medieval peasant might endure filth that would sicken us instantly, yet they could die from a tooth abscess or a contaminated well. We in turn live longer and healthier lives thanks to vaccines, antibiotics and nutrition, but we are also more vulnerable to immune overreactions, allergies and modern diseases of abundance. Ultimately, immunity is not a competition across centuries. It is a reflection of the environment each generation faces. The medieval body was built to survive mud, smoke and scarcity. Ours is built for sanitised cities, hospitals and global pandemics. Both reveal the same truth. The human immune system is less about invincibility and more about adaptation. And perhaps that is the real lesson. Strength lies not in being unbreakable, but in the ability to endure and adapt to the world we inherit.